Thank you very much, Robert, for that sweet introduction. Um, I need to also return the compliment and say that I learned a lot from Robert uh, as well in his work on his marvelous dissertation on uh, the different uh, formations of the human body in Tai Chi and classical ballet practice. I highly recommend it and I'm glad to hear that it will soon appear as a book. Um, before I begin, uh, I wanted to mention, as you see, I've changed the title uh, just a little bit, uh, um, somewhat disturbing the alliteration, but making it a little bit more precise. <coughs> um, and I also wanted to mention that um, uh, the uh, I, I don't include any references to literature on my slides, but uh, the, there is a list of references uh, that those of you who are really interested in human-animal communication uh, can uh, uh, pick up uh, on the table at the ex at the well. Then it will be the exit. Um, and I finally wanted to thank uh, Stefan Hirschauer and everybody else for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and spend some time with you. Um, so, um, let me uh, show you what I <clears throat> want to talk about. <clears throat> so, what I want to do today is tell you a conversion story. I have recently converted from being a rigid critic of pets and pet ownership, especially the US American version, to being a passion, passionate lover of cats, one in particular, an old man smitten by a kitten. This conversion happened when I transited from a, a long-term ownership or rather food, food suppliership of successive pairs of outdoor stray cats who made my yard their home to constant affectionate companionship with the cat that I adopted as a kitten, too small to be left outside where owls and coyotes loom and who, when she is inside, is almost always by my side. The following is my first attempt to rationalize this completely banal pet story and pretend that it is a science experiment a serious attempt to explain how intersubjectivity is possible between two such unlike bodies and minds. How was it possible that uh, my cat and I built a reliable, if subtly changing, social world together without a common language? And what does this possibility tell us about sociality and intersubjectivity as such? These questions interest me in part because my research has often centered around the intercorporeal basis of human interacting and understanding. But when we study human interaction, language is almost always there, at least as a possibility, and it is therefore difficult for us to imagine how our ancestors built social worlds without it. Studying communication with non-human animals, I believe, gives us at least glimpses of such a social reality. And then I have also lately developed an interest in touch as a mode of communication, and being connected to a cat is, as everyone knows, an eminently tactile affair. Actually, I believe that my case of falling for a cat is just an example of a larger trend. Cats seem to be becoming wildly popular these days as models for a peaceful, hedonistic and affectionate social life. Finally, and this is a more local motif, my conversion also constituted a switch from a category based to an individuated or interpersonal mode of perceiving and relating to another. I leave it up to you to replace my cat's name wherever I mention it by the word other. I used to treat my outdoor cats as just that, cats. Um, these are, this was the last pair, um, uh, Minette uh, and Felicia. So I assumed that all cats are for all practical purposes alike, 
exemplars of a species category members. I gave them food twice a day and shunned them or shushed them when they begged for food before mealtime or hissed at them when they were in my way. They, in turn, usually would not let me touch them. Thus, our engagements were only visual, oral, and practical, and I did not differentiate between the cats, no matter that their different personalities were always on display. I admired their autonomy and enjoyed seeing them asleep in their nests or on the ground near me, but otherwise did not care. Cats are cats, and all they want from me is food. My notion of cats had all the features of biased thinking that I explained to my students in intercultural communication. Right? So I stereotyped them. Right? Individuals are categorized on the basis of easily identifiable characteristics. Right? All cats are, at least look somewhat alike. Right? I ascribed a set of attributes to them. Uh, and assumed that all members of the category cat uh, 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 were alike. I, in other words, I ascribed these uh, features uh, to all of them. So I assumed that all members of the category cat are similar to each other and different from other uh, categories of animals. And so then, uh, in the manner of stereotypical thinking, right, I attributed this set of attributes to each individual member. And uh, if ever I met a cat that did not meet my expectations, uh, I explained those as exceptions, right? Uh, in my intercultural class, I apply this not to cats, but to immigrants, right, uh, to explain how we stereotype members of other ethnic or cultural groups. Um, but then uh, Miss Lonesome appeared, right? Um, Minette, the least interesting of my outdoor cats, disappeared one day, and I had resolved that whenever that would happen, I would uh, uh, adopt a, a little cat finally having the pleasure of having a kitten. Um, uh, and uh, this happened to be during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and so uh, adopting a cat meant to uh, have a Zoom date uh, with um, uh, people and cats in a shelter. And, uh, uh, and no new stray cats having appeared, I then, you know, made this uh, attempt to adopt a kitten. Um, uh, but the first Zoom meeting uh, was with two uh, siblings, uh, very cute cats, but I had to compete with seven or eight families, uh, whereas uh, Miss Lonesome, uh, as she was called then, uh, was alone. Uh, and there were no other takers because she had ringworm, uh, an infectious but highly treatable skin disease for which kittens in many other shelters get killed. For the first two weeks, I had to keep her in the shed and could touch her only with my glove, with gloves. So let me say an example of that. And I should mention that, uh, you know, as you will quickly notice, I made most of these videos with my iPhone, and so I, you really don't see the whole interaction. You only see the behavior of the cat. But <clears throat> uh, these are mainly sort of illustrative and not uh, research materials. Uh, I rely more on, you can call this an auto-ethnographic account, right? But these touches, despite the thick glove, gloves, were the beginning of an intimate and importantly trusting relationship. Touch, touch produced attachment. I could feel with my hands how jazzy, as I had renamed her, slowly relaxed, how her heart rate decreased, how her breathing slowed down and became regu regular, how she eased into being with me and began to trust me and feel my protection. Eventually, she would usually sigh deeply and then fall asleep. I should mention that cats are not only hunters, but also prey animals. 
and so they tend to be cautious, fearful, and circumspect. I believe that what Jazzy took away from this togetherness was at first a sense of safety. She learned to trust me, she understood that I meant no harm. Slowly then, as I for my part began to trust her, to trust that she would not run away, I allowed her to be outdoors anytime she wanted and for as long as she liked in the daytime. Coyotes and owls uh, hunt at night. <clears throat> so uh, let me uh, say a little bit about intersubjectivity. Um, Intersubjectivity is a term that has a shallow and a deep meaning. Under a shallow meaning, a reading, it is either used synonymously with mutual understanding, or it means uh, that a scientific observation or experiment mental result is not only available to a single researcher, but to any researcher. For the deeper meaning, I draw on uh, the last book of my late brother, Ulrich Dreck, who wrote that intersubjectivity means a relationship between subjects who recognize one another as subjects when they communicate and interact with one another. The word subject, he wrote, is used to refer to the person as a being that can make itself the object of attention and thought. When I interact with my cat, do I recognize her as subject of her own actions? Does she recognize me as a social subject? I think surely. Do I recognize her as a being that can make herself the object of her own attention and thought? This is less certain, but it also may not be required for intersubjectivity and interspecies communication. The philosopher Peter Godfrey Smith, who is also a scuba driver, describes in his book Other Minds his intimate encounters with an octopus and his re enduring relationship with it that octopuses can indeed form relationship with individual humans has become popular knowledge due to the Oscar-winning Netflix documentary, The Octopus Teacher, and Godfrey Smith's story is in many ways similar to the one told in the movie. He frames it as an encounter between two species whose last common ancestor lived 350 million years ago and points out that unusual cognitive and communicative abilities appear on many only distantly connected and often random seeming branches of the evolutionary tree. Islands of mental complexity, he calls this. To this day, human intelligence and language are usually compared with our closest relatives, the great apes. See, for example, the work of Michael Tomasello. However, writes Godfrey Smith, if we want to understand other minds, the minds of cephalopods are the most other at all. Octopus minds are distributed across a complex but shapeless body with a very large number of neurons inhabiting the arms or legs with which they not only move and grasp but feel and taste. He writes, the motions uh, guided by the arm's own chemical and the motions are guided by the arm's own chemical and tactile senses, not by vision. Specific patterns of neural act activation give arms their own short-term memory. And an octopus can transform its body shape almost indefinitely. What is it like to be such a, a body or, and, uh, and uh, such a mind to experience the world and think as such a body? The same questions, if perhaps in a less spectacular way, can be asked about our interactions with pets in particular with pets that do not have a history of human intervention in their breeding, as, as dogs do, um, and, and thus intervention in their these dispositions and skills. Cats fit this description. However, instead of speculating about the mind of my cat, which is as unknowable as that of a fellow human, I will concentrate on the social life between us. Little kittens in good shelters are handled every day. Petting and holding them eases their way into forming rela relationships with humans. I assume that Jazzy had been handled very well because she showed little fear of humans when they approach her cautiously. 
I have already described how I held and caressed her when she was little and how this tactility formed our first bond of attachment. The second communication modality that mattered in our forming of a relationship was gaze. The calm, patient ways in which she would look at me or observe me, or look me in the eye or observe me. I cannot overstate the power that this look had on me. It was key to my conversion. Undoubtedly, here was a little soul speaking to me, an extraterrestrial telling me, I trust you and I hitch myself to you. Nature was speaking to me in an entirely new way. It said, you or thou. In other words, just like in human communication, gaze, the gaze of a cat is a form of address it establishes the other as a single subject, and thus it establishes the connection between two, between two subjects. The third modality, very similar in its effects as gaze, was proximity, the fact that Jazzy very soon began to follow me around. He would sit observing me doing things in the kitchen, explore the objects on my desk and bookshelves, and then make her nest on or in my armchair from where I could watch her amusing sleeping position. There's a website by a literary critic that is entitled, entitled Beauty is a Sleeping Cat. This is an, uh, a sentiment that I fully share. Always to this day, Jazzy will follow me into the bathroom and vigorously clean herself on the bathroom mat by my feet. Often, she, who is now three, three years old, comes into my study and quietly settles behind my desk chair. The pheno this phenomenon that Jazzy seeks out my company, as common as, as it may be among house cats, continues to puzzle me. It is a version of the problem of other minds. Why me? What am I to her? What does she see in me? To me, it meant that this newly arrived animal, not I, proposed that we would relate to one another in a unique and committed manner, that our relationship would be different from any other relationship she or I have. She singled me out. She came on my lap, stayed close to me, slept on my back. In these when, ways, then, I switched from relating to cats as category members to relating to one cat as a person. It was because she decategorized me, related to me as a distinct, specific social subject, a person. Barbara Smuts, a psychologist who gained the trust of a troop of baboons and became a peripheral member of their troop, describes the personality personality changing impact of this decategorization. She writes, before living among baboons, if I were walking in the woods and came across a squirrel, I would enjoy its presence, but I would experience it as a member of a class squirrel. Now I experience every squirrel I encounter as a small fuzzy tailed person like creature. Even though I usually don't know this squirrel from another, I know that if I tried, I would, and that once I did, the squirrel would reveal itself as an utterly unique being, different in temperament and behavior from every other squirrel in the world. In addition, I am aware that if the squirrel had a chance to get to know me, he or she might relate to me differently to any other than to any other person in the world. My awareness of the individuality of all beings and of the capacity of at least some beings to re respond to the individuality in me transforms the world into a universe replete with opportunities to develop relationship, personal relationships of all kinds. Such relationships can be ephemeral, like those developed with the birds in whose territory we might picnic, or lifelong, like those established with cats, dogs, and human friends. I have no time here, but must at least mention the British musician and amateur ethologist Len Howard, who devoted her life to wild birds and shared her home with them. 
Her book, Birds as Individuals, published to great success in 1952, but for a long time since forgotten, has recently influenced many people in the Animals Are Persons camp. Most important for the building of any interspecies social world are interaction routines that evolve between the parties. This has been marvelously demonstrated by the symbolic interactionist sociologists Janet and Stephen Alger in their book, in their study of a cat shelter called Cat Culture. They describe both routines that emerge among individual cats and between individual humans and cats and they offer much evidence that individual cats can even play distinct roles, roles in the sociological sense, such as overseer within such a complex organization as a shelter. They write, cat culture at the shelter is a web of socially transmitted behaviors which make up the solutions that this group of animals has developed for, de developed for solving its everyday problems. The culture, culture at this shelter promotes friendship, affection, and social cohesion, and the opposing forces of aggression, dominance, and territory are of little significance. The Dutch philosopher and writer Eva Meyer, whose work has also been translated into German, has also written a quasi-fictional auto autobiography of Len Howard entitled Bird Cottage, and Eva Meyer argues in her book, Eva Meyer argues in her book Animal Languages that Wittgenstein's concept of language games is appropriate for thinking about communication with animals, as it does not give a fixed definition and is therefore suitable for studying a variety of linguistic actions. Language games, she writes, extend beyond words alone to gestures, posture, movement, and sound. Wittgenstein's emphasis on the relationship between usage and meaning provides a new angle from which to study language with and of animals in which skepticism about other animals' thinking no longer plays a role. We do not, do not need to know what is inside their heads to determine whether or not they speak. Several methodologies such as the ethnography of communication and Bateson-inspired context analysis have transformed Wittgenstein's vision of language games into empirical research program. The most important and influential of these approaches is conversation analysis. Conversation analysis has established action sequences, temporarily, temporarily ordered social actions performed by alternating participants as the basic units of social interaction. Actions in sequences are not only temporally, but also pragmatically or functionally ordered. An initiating action makes some responsive action conditionally relevant. I made it a policy from the beginning to reward Jazzy whenever she initiated an, action, an interaction sequence by producing the conditionally relevant next I wanted to let her experience that she could control my actions by her own communicative acts, that I am a social subject that is responsive to her subjectivity. Thus, when she somehow solicited my attention and then started walking towards the kitchen, I would follow her and give her a bit of the food from the fridge or a treat from a shelf towards which she was guiding me. To this day, she will keep close to my feet and stop and look back, making sure I am coming when she is a bit ahead of me. Uh, and I all, all, I, I, and initially, I would also always give young Jazzy a small treat. I called it a Heimkehr Prämie, when she came back into the house after being outside. So... So here she is guiding me. Mm. 
no food there. So I have to edit this a little bit of the food, right? So let me then discuss the key interaction routines that have evolved between me and my uncategorized other, and that together form a, social, a solid foundation for our shared social life. Some of these were invented by me, the human, others by Jazzy, the cat, yet others emerged spontaneously between us. The first is an example of a sequence that accomplishes nothing. It is phatic communication, a small episode of quasi-grooming, a call and response or summons response sequence. And here I actually do need the, um, the you will hear the sound, I hope. Uh, actually, I might, otherwise I might move the phone. Well, you'll hear it. And I uh, apologize that I was forced when I recorded it. Jazzy. You hear it? Jazzy. 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 Right. Um, so this little clip uh, gives an example of what we can call transmodal or bimodal communication. I initiate the sequence with the vocal act, Jazzy completes it with the wag of her tail. We can see turn taking, right, but I would rather call this call and response, right, I call on her and she responds. <clears throat> and this is a very stable routine. Uh, if she were here and she would be somewhat asleep or tired, um, I could demonstrate this to you. Except there's been a little change. Now she will initiate the wagging of her tail as soon as she hears me beginning to speak. And um, I do not have the time to discuss my ongoing conversation with Jazz in Jazzy's presence. I talk to her all day, explain what I am doing, give her my reasons, in almost exactly the same way that I talked to my children when they were pre-verbal infants. And I have no doubt that Jazzy enjoys being talked to in this way. A routine that has become somewhat reliable. I can expect that Jazzy will complete the sequence when I initiate it, when I initiate it unfolds when she is outside and I may or may not know where she is. When I call her and she can hear me, is not asleep and properly disposed, she will appear and come towards me, her tail erect in the greeting position, and when she reaches me, greet me and let me greet her. Initially, greeting meant that I would extend my hand to her, she would sniff it, and then I would caress her hat and back, her head and back. But at some point, Jazzy began to lay down, well, you know, flip over, turn on her back, exposing her belly to me so I could scratch it. And now this sequence is the canonical format of the call approach greeting sequence. Jazzy favors being belly scratched when her back is on a rough or textured surface. When she approaches me outside after I call her, she will sometimes guide me to a patch of tall grass and flip over there for double pleasure. So I don't have a, a, a full greeting sequence here, but this is what that part then looks like. <clears throat> so I'm sure this is not uh, news to any cat owner, <laughs> right? Um, but Jazzy also calls on me. 
When I am seated, she will sometimes get on her hind legs and touch me with her front paws or scratch the chair or sofa where I am sitting. And when she is really hungry or badly wants to go outside, she meows with her very tiny voice. One of Jazzy's own invention is what I call ambush. When I walk in the direction of the kitchen where food and treats are, but then turn towards the bathroom or somewhere else, or leave the kitchen before giving her any treat, Jazzy will um ambush me by grabbing my ankle with one or two paws from behind, with her claw sometimes out, sometimes not. She realizes that an anticipative course of action by me will not happen, that I do not take the direction she thought I would, and she thwarts my, uh, um, my unexpected course. She intervenes with a haptic act, corrects my action trajectory, and steers our interaction towards the sequence that she anticipated and prefers. We can call this other initiated repair. She initiates the repair and I complete it. Jazzy's ambush is a sign. It does obstruct my progress, but she could not drag me into the kitchen in this fashion. But with a little bit of anthropomorphism, we could say that she is showing me that she would if she could. A variety of play sequences have evolved over time between Jazzy and myself, but only one or two have survived. Our play began in the manner recommended by how-to books luring the kitten with feathers on a stick, making her chase strings, shoelaces, the red dot from a laser pointer. A rather dog-like game that Jazzy invented and liked to play for a while when I was in or on my bed involved me throwing a ball on a string and her chasing it and then bringing it back to me so that I would throw it again. But she has long in lost interest in that. So this is an example. And she would only do that with this particular toy, maybe because of its affordances. Right, and then I would have to throw it again. <laughs> and uh, I suppose this is called, uh, dog owners will call this a porté, <laughs> right? Um, incidentally, this uh, is an example of slow change in our interaction routines, something else I find noteworthy. Interaction routines are not fixed, or our interaction routines are not fixed. They change of their own accord or in response to changing social environments. Again, I do not have time, uh, the time to address uh, the additional level of, this additional level of complexity, what you may call the biographical dimension, especially not the rapid ev evolution and change of routines when my old outdoor cat Felicia who recently left us to die alone, decided to move into the house for her retirement. One game that has survived is entirely Jazzy's invention, and it was built on top of another solitary kind of play, namely the play of making objects disappear under a door and then move to the other side to find it and push it back, etc. Uh, the surviving game uh, involves a stuffed mouse, uh, her favorite toy, which uh, incidentally I found in my suitcase when I first opened it. Somehow <laughs> she put it in my suitcase before I left. I suppose that was coincidental, but you know, you can always read more into it. Um, the surviving games, uh, game involves a stuffed mouse and is centered around a bench that I built and that has a door-like gap, you know, underneath the red, uh, the, that red bar there, right? It's like uh, similar to a door and the space underneath it. Um, uh, right, so Jazzy initiates this game almost every evening by lying by the bench, the mouse nearby, 
and looking at me expectantly. I will then either lure her with the mouse or throw the mouse at her. When the mouse is on her side, Jazzy flips over the beam so she's on the other side, making it more difficult to reach the mouse. She creates a task or a problem for herself. Whenever the mouse is out of her reach, it is my turn to throw it at her or to instigate her by making it appear and disappear, in which case she usually lunges for it, catches it, and then chews on it with abandon and refusing to release it into my grasp. Right, can I see if it's over? I actually had to watch this in slow motion to understand what exactly she does when she moves over. So usually this goes on for like 10 minutes or so, usually depending on my disposition, right? Uh, Michel de Montaigne asked himself, when I play with my cat, how do I know that she is not passing time with me rather than I with her? Well, I know that it is indeed my cat who passes her time with me or who needs me and uses me to make her own play possible. An extended sequence which I started early on is our dinner routine. When I first got jazzy, she would get on the table where I was eating dinner and try to get to my food. I would have to put her back down, but she would usually try again, becoming a nuisance. I eventually uh, decided to get a treat, or a, a little stick that you can break into pieces and which comes in an en envelope. I would open the envelope and take out a third of the stick and hold it above the chair next to me. Jazzy would then jump on the chair, reach up for the stick, throw it down to the ground and jump after it and eat it or play with it for a while before she ate it. Then she comes back on the chair, onto the chair for more until the stick is eaten. After the third piece, Jazzy is usually content to leave my food alone and goes away or settles somewhere on the large table, leaving my food alone. We have kept up this routine, and when we are in the kitchen I put, and I put food on my plate or reach up for a stick, Jazzy will run into the living room and take her place on the chair next to me, awaiting my arrival. I think these are good examples of interaction routines, or this is a good example of an interaction routine that have become sedimented or entrenched because they solve problems of social coordination. One of the most elaborate routines, entirely Jazzy's invention, is how she wakes me, usually between 5.45 and 6.15. First, she will loudly scratch on an iPad sleeve on the floor next to my bed, which she is allowed to. If I show no reaction, she will next jump over the bed with a forceful interim stomp on my body. If I still do not re react, she will repeat this and every so often she remains standing on my ribcage or thigh. If I still don't react, she will eventually settle down on the bed until I demonstrably wake up, at which point she immediately jumps from the bed. Always, the slightest motion on my part is taken by her as the beginning of my levée, which completes the wake-up sequence. Conversation analysts a conversation analysis is a synchronous enterprise 
which takes sequence formats as established known and common cultural givens, possessions of a society or perhaps humankind. In my interactions with my cat, however, I experienced how se such sequences come into being, emerging over time across interaction episodes and eventually becoming sedimented as routines, as social institution, institutions. Barbara Smuts writes about her life with her dog. Safi and I have created many rituals involving synchronous and complementary movements which develop spontaneously in the intersubjective space we inhabit together. They are part of our shared culture, of a way of being together unique to the two of us. This shared culture emerges from our deep bond and its expression, its expression continuously deepens our relationship still further. Every vocalization by her or me that the other understands, every subtle movement that the other tunes into, Every ritual we enact together simultaneously reveals a mutual past and an ongoing commitment to a common future in which the circle of shared experience and fellow feeling grows even larger. So I come to my last part before my conclusion about companionship and mutual touch. The stations where I conduct my daily activities are pretty much settled. Desk, dinner table, sofa, bed, easy chair, kitchen, toilet, and various chairs outside. Thus, it is usually other, or jazzy, who follows me to one of these stations, not the other way around, except for the guiding uh, interaction I showed you. In the morning after she has eaten and is ready to go to sleep, and before I settle somewhere, Jazzy will sit on her behind or her legs somewhere where she can observe me until I settle down, at which point she will join me, preparing the place where she will clean herself and then go to sleep. In line with what you can often see in cartoons, Jazzy to this day likes to lay down um, on the very paper in front of me that I'm writing or reading, disrupting my work for a while. But it does not feel like a disruption, but rather in, in, as an attempt to join in my activity or perhaps simply to be as close to me as she can. When she was little, Jazzy often crawled onto my lap and cleaned herself and fell asleep there, usually when I was sitting in my armchair or lying on the sofa or bed reading. Eventually she stopped, stopped doing this, but a year or two later she began to return for occasional visits for example, after I return from a trip. In this, she much resembles a human child that leaves, eventually leaves her parents' lap when she grows older in order to occasionally return for a bit of regressive cuddling. Either in my lap or far more commonly next to my legs on the sofa or bed, bed Jazzy knows she will correct, be caressed, stroked, petted, tickled. So this is an, uh, uh, an example of not of tickling or petting, but of her return uh, when I came back from a trip to Mexico. So she is deeply relaxed and deeply asleep, right? And uh, this is uh, not, doesn't happen often, so, but it happened then. I try to touch Jazzy tactfully, attuned to her responses, not overpowering her. For example, I know that Jazzy likes to have her head and cheeks caressed mainly when she is sleepy. Um. Felicia, who always tried to get on anyone's lap once she had moved indoors, participated vigorously in being petted, not just presenting the parts of her body that she wanted caressed, but forcing them into one's head. Head bumps like hers are common among cats. However, Jazzy never does them. Felicia also likes what you can call deep tissue massage. Right? So while she spent most of her days then uh, lying uh, in a corner, 
uh, and ate very little and got thinner and thinner, she would always still come back uh, to be cuddled. The philosopher Patterson writes, physiologically, touch is a modality re uh, resulting from the combined information of innumerable receptors and nerve endings concerned with pressure, temperature, pain, and movement. But there is more to touch. It is a sense of communication. It is receptive, expressive, can communicate empathy. It can bring distant objects and people into proximity. And the immediacy of tactile sens sensations is affirmatory and comforting, involving a mutual, mutual co-implication of one's body and another's presence. Touch can cement an empathic or affective bond. And another philosopher, Glenn Massis, wrote, in the very act of touching, one is touched in turn. In touch, the distinction between touching subject and touched object blurs. There is a permeability of boundaries and an opening up of interpenetration of communion. This is the distinguishing possibility of touch and like all possibilities can be achieved to a greater or lesser extent and is never realized in an absolute sense. Rather, the experience of touch hovers along a continuum that can approach the, that can approach the pole of activity and passivity given the context of the experience. I don't remember when Jazzy first started to sleep on my bed. It may have been from the very beginning. She would usually make her nest beside my feet, cleaning herself profusely, profusely, tiring herself out thereby, and then fall asleep. But over time, a complex ritual evolved. Jazzy began, what, began to perform what I called her evening prayer, a strange custom among many cats. She rhythmically stomps her front paws, standing up, then seated, and is clearly in an altered stays, state. Her eyes are often glazed over. She is not attentive to anything unless there is a loud noise, and often she purrs, something she otherwise does not do. In tech, Texas, this is not this is uh, uh, called making tacos. Usually, will she will stomp on her feet on what I call her prayer mat, a piece of clothing or paper. Uh, her fa her favorite being the New Yorker and very rarely my belly or, or uh, chest. Um, so I forgot to mention that I call this prayer, right? Jazzy is not a religious fanatic. She often misses out on her evening prayer or prays in the morning or in the afternoon. Right, so cat owners, cat parents uh, know this, right? I find it quite mysterious and I think Nobody has really found an explanation for this yet. Some people say this is derived from uh, cats, little cats, sort of uh, pushing against her mother's uh, breasts. <clears throat> right, so this is a daytime prayer, prayer. Right? So these are not programs that run their course, but to an extent situated choices and engagements in gendering variable affective states. Having prayed or not, Jazzy nowadays typically settles without, within reach of my arm and hand, and when she starts cleaning herself, I pet her. Eventually, she will begin to lick my palm and fingers at the same pace and with the same rhythm as she licks herself, sometimes switching back and forth between her body surface and mine. I cannot tell whether she perceives the nearness of my hand as a request or an opportunity, but sometimes when I withdraw my hand, she will grab it and pull it back. And here, another example uh, in a different place. Uh, right.
So clearly there's a mutuality there, right? <clears throat> Our aloe grooming, as uh, ethologists call this, illustrates the dual dimensions of touch. <laughs> to be, on one hand, a production of sensations and feelings in oneself and the other, on the other hand, being a means of meaning-making and communication. Whereas Jazzy's fur feels wonderful to me uh, as I groom her, Jazzy's tongue does not at all feel pleasant when she grooms me. It is very rough, and whatever affection for me Jazzy may express by grooming me, um, if any, her tongue scratches. I sustain the discomfort because it is cancelled out by the emotional meaning that I take from this, that her grooming me is a sign of attachment and a way of living and renewing it. Actually, I have one more short part. Weenus. Phenomenologists and sociologists have proposed that humans in interaction sometimes achieve a state of weenus a state in which the participant's subjectivities merge with one another and the boundary between self and other becomes suspended or submerged. Goffman has called this unit of interactional participation, for example, a couple telling a story together or a family navigating a sidewalk as a single vehicular unit, a with. Heidegger wrote about a primarial primordial state of miteinander, a parallel and joined orientation to the world. Note then that this kind of weeness is not achieved by, or is not the same weeness as, that of face-to-face -face interaction, mutual grooming, or conversation. Rather, it refers to two or more individuals united in their perspective upon the environment, the world. I experience weenus with Jazzy most intensely, intensely during nightfall when I sit in front of my house with her in my lap. As I always like sitting there facing west during sunset, I included Jazzy from the beginning, picking her up, putting her on my lap, making her face in the same direction as I, and holding and petting her there. I have no doubt that Jazzy enjoys spending the twilight hour this way just as much as I, as she sometimes initiates our Schumerstunde herself. For a while she will be very alert, instantaneously responding to any sight or sound or smell, while my own gaze may be turned inward. Right, so... Uh. This is uh, right, and here she grooms me again. Um, and by now it's dark. Um, usually we get out there. Uh, nightfall is very quick in, in Texas. <clears throat> Eventually, Jazzy may clean herself and so, then slowly fall asleep, or she will fall asleep without cuts and vegetables. It is during these moments before she goes to sleep that I feel most strongly that Jazzy and I are one we, the Miteinander in Heidegger's sense. I recognize in her a fellow ethnographer who is attentive to and immersed in the world, but not actively engaged with it, an equanimous, equanimous distant observer. We are two of a kind, two very likely, very unlike minds of one mind. For a while and intermittently as we are sitting there, I will talk to her, my cat, and she will wag her tail in response. We can have conversations of several minutes this way, me talking with my mouth, producing sounds, she talking with her tail, inadvertently caressing my chest with it. So let me sum up and come to my conclusion. I hope to have convinced you that intersubjectivity an interactional workings consensus, a shared social world, do not need a shared language to emerge and be sustained. Intersubjectivity, mutual understanding, reciprocity, and the sharing of experience are equally possible with access to or understanding of the content of the other mind, and certainly without a theory of mind, 
that we project onto the other and assume she projects upon us. Intersubjectivity arises from trust and attachment through shared practices and interaction routines, just like Wittgenstein suggested. To achieve this form of intersubjectivity, however, it is all important to decategorize the other, to not perceive her as a member of a category or species, but to recognize the other simply as a living subject, a person, a self. Decategorizing also means suspending any assumptions of what the other will do and what, what she will do will mean, unless these assumptions are grounded in routines that have emerged biographically in the life one has lived together. Donna Haraway has proposed, and I agree with this, that human-animal relationships represent the smallest unit of analysis that can be used to explore whether relationships in societies can teach us an ethics and politics committed to the flourishing of significant otherness. And Barbara Smuts writes, there is an inherent paradox in intersubjectivity because participation in the relationship cannot be coerced, but must, by definition, reflect independent agency by each animal. Yet at the same time, the relationship creates for each individual a new subjective reality, a shared language, culture, or experience that transcends without negating the individuality of the participants. Such intersubjectivity implies the presence in another of something resembling a human self. The presence, she goes on, we recognize in another when we meet in mutuality is something we feel more than something we know. In mutuality, we sense that inside this other body, there is someone home, someone so like ourselves in their essence that we can co-create a shared reality as equals through creative and caring intersubjectivity. The writer Colette has written that time spent with the cat is never wasted. It is not wasted, one might add, because it shows us that social life is and always was possible without language in the human sense. We will never know the inner lives of others, uh, whatever species they are, and yet it is possible to live rewarding lives with them. Thank you. Thank you.